C'est un, un grand plaisir, évidemment, d'accueillir José Schenkman pour cette journée à Dauphine. Tout de suite, je, je ne peux pas m'empêcher de, de redire une phrase qui, qui a été prononcée par Pierre-Louis Lyon auparavant, c'est que pour faire de bonnes mathématiques appliquées à la décision, il faut d'abord faire de bonnes mathématiques. Et certainement, José incarne merveilleusement cette, cette maxime, ce principe raisonnable. Euh, il, a, euh, il est né à Rio de, de Janeiro au Brésil et, et là il a d'abord euh, étudié un petit peu d'économie mais surtout des mathématiques, il a obtenu une bonne formation en mathématiques et il nous avait dit quand on l'avait rencontré à Chicago il y a bien longtemps que pour ce qui est de l'économie euh, il ne faisait pas tant confiance, j'espère ne pas trop, trop livrer de, de secrets mais il ne faisait pas tant confiance euh, à, à ce qui s'était enseigné à l'époque euh, à Rio et il est alors allé à Rochester euh, pour faire donc une thèse d'économie. Euh, où il a euh, rencontré notamment Lionel Mackenzie et, euh, et William Brock. Euh, après, il fait une carrière absolument euh, sensationnelle à l'Université de Chicago, dont on a dit, et je pense que vous le savez tous, c'est un des meilleurs départements d'économie du monde, c'est peut-être en tout cas un des départements les, les plus connus. Et, et là, euh, il fait une carrière de, de 25 ans euh, avec, euh, avec une succession de promotions. Euh, il est professeur assistant, euh, professeur associé, full professor, etc., etc., jusqu'à diriger le département. Euh, après cela, il va rejoindre Princeton et ensuite l'Université de Columbia euh, à New York. Euh, alors, il, il a évidemment un nombre impressionnant de, de distinctions, euh, parmi lesquelles on peut mentionner un doctorat honoris causa de Dauphine en 2001, et euh, il faudrait bien sûr insister d'emblée sur le fait qu'il a été très présent à Dauphine, visiteur très régulier du CRMA de, de 85 à 95. Euh, il a une chaire Grèce Pascal à Paris, qu'il a amenée euh, dans différentes institutions parisiennes, mais aussi bien sûr euh, à Dauphine. Et parmi euh, les, les distinctions, bon, il est fellow de la, euh, de la Société d'économétrie, euh, aussi de euh, l'American Finance Association, il est membre de l'Académie des sciences américaines, etc. Alors vous avez vu mentionner dans, le, dans le, la petite présentation qui est faite dans la brochure un prix qui est peut-être moins connu et qui avait des sigles que je ne connaissais pas complètement moi-même, donc je vais, je vais vous éclairer là-dessus. Euh, le MSRI, c'est le Mathematical Sciences Research Institute de Berkeley, qui était fondé au début des années 80 et qui est euh, donc un centre de recherche mathématique qui fonctionne un petit peu comme un institut d'études avancées. Et puis euh, CME, c'est euh, une entreprise financière américaine, donc pour, vous pourrez voir les détails euh, euh, à l'occasion, mais qui est issue donc du Chicago Mercantile euh, Exchange. Et euh, elle récompense, des, prix, elle récompense des, des chercheurs qui sont marqués par euh, leur originalité et leur innovation, dans l'usage de méthodes mathématiques pour l'étude du comportement des marchés. Et là, à nouveau, euh, ça cadre parfaitement avec euh, ce qu'a euh, pu faire euh, José Schenkman. Alors, je vais vous donner, mais très rapidement, euh, un aperçu euh, donc de, de sa recherche. Euh, les premiers travaux sont extrêmement euh, mathématiques, et c'est ce qu'on appelait à l'époque de l'économie mathématique, mais il y a presque plus de mathématiques que d'économie, et il s'agit euh, d'étudier des modèles euh, économiques dynamiques. Euh, et dans, dans cette première phase, première phase, il collabore notamment pas mal avec William Brock. Alors, il y a une, une, une phase qui n'est pas si longue, mais à laquelle je tiens personnellement beaucoup, et qui, 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 qui me paraît très, très importante, et, et qui, qui devrait reprendre même de l'importance aujourd'hui. Il s'agit de, de travaux sur la théorie de l'oligopole. Et nous, 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 euh, on a eu quelques rappels là, tout à l'heure sur l'équilibre de Nash, euh, et les économistes savent bien qu'il y a euh, deux grands équilibres de, que, auxquels on peut penser pour euh, les, les oligopoles. Il y a la concurrence en, en prix qui se, qui se euh, concrétise par un, un équilibre à la Bertrand, Bertrand étant bien sûr un, un célèbre économiste du, du 19e siècle, et, et, et parallèlement on a aussi euh, Cournot, qui est l'autre paradigme, et euh, on, on a tendance à, à croire que ce sont des modèles séparés et ce que José Schenkman a pu montrer dans de nombreux travaux, mais notamment dans un article extrêmement célèbre avec David Krebs, c'est que le fait qu'on ait une forme de concurrence ou l'autre dépendait vraiment du contexte et des possibilités stratégiques des membres du duopole. Et donc, pour autant que l'on ait une première étape où on peut s'engager sur des quantités à produire, le fait qu'on soit ensuite en concurrence en prix, 
ne va pas nous donner le modèle typique de Bertrand, mais va nous ramener à la concurrence à la Courneau, parce que ce qui comptait, c'était les actions qu'on avait fixées dès le, dé, dès le début de l'interaction. Et donc, c'est vraiment au cœur de la théorie des jeux. Ça montre à quel point le contexte est très, très important. Et euh, il ne faut pas, bien sûr, s'attacher à un mode d'équilibre plutôt qu'à un autre. Euh, il faut regarder exactement où euh, se place l'interaction stratégique. Et ce sont des travaux qui ont eu pas mal d'impact et euh, qui sont euh, extrêmement importants. Alors, il y a aussi des travaux qui touchent plus à des spécialités de Chicago euh, la, et, et notamment la, la théorie de la croissance. Donc, il y a, il y a cet article que je serais absolument incapable d'expliquer qui s'appelle « Growth in Cities », qui a plus de 6000 citations et qui est écrit avec un, un, un des, des anciens doctorants donc de, de José. Il en a eu de, 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 très, de très brillants. Donc là, il s'agissait d'Edward Gleeser. Un, un autre doctorant que je ne peux pas m'empêcher de citer, c'est Paul Romer, qui est un, un visiteur habituel de Dauphine et évidemment qui est extrêmement, extrêmement connu. Alors, les, les travaux les plus, les plus récents et et dont José va, va nous parler aujourd'hui, euh, concerne euh, la, la, la finance et euh, surtout la, la, la compréhension des, de la spéculation en finance et des phénomènes de, de bulles. Et là, et là aussi, on repense immédiatement à l'exposé précédent parce qu'il s'agit bien de comprendre et prédire le comportement collectif d'un grand nombre d'acteurs. Et, et comme dans, dans ce qui nous a été présenté par Pierre-Louis Lyons, euh, le grand nombre d'acteurs et le temps continu vont jouer un rôle essentiel dans la modélisation euh, financière. Euh, par contre, ce qui va aussi être très important et qui n'apparaissait pas, je pense, dans les modèles dont on nous a parlé pendant la première partie, c'est que ici, là, une des clés pour comprendre ce qui se passe, c'est l'hétérogénéité des croyances des agents. Pour qu'il y ait spéculation, il faut qu'il y ait des optimistes et des pessimistes. Ça a l'air euh, évidemment d'une trivialité, mais pour faire entrer cela correctement euh, dans un modèle, il faut pas mal de talent, et c'est euh, le genre de talent dont euh, José est parfaitement euh, capable. Et donc, je crois qu'il va vous donner un échantillon de, de ce qu'il peut faire euh, en la matière dans l'exposé qui suit. Merci, Françoise. José, je te laisse la parole. Merci. Bon, je vais faire mon exposé en anglais, mais je veux au début parler quelques mots en français. Euh, C'est vraiment un grand honneur pour moi de prendre la parole aujourd'hui. Je souhaite remercier la présidente Isabelle Hugo et le vice-président Bruno Bouchard de leur invitation. Je suis venu à Dauphine pour la première fois il y a plus de 35 ans. Au CIMA, j'ai rencontré un groupe remarquable de mathématiciens, Yves Eklin, Jean-Michel Lasserie, Pierre-Louis Lyons, euh, qui faisaient des progrès considérables dans le développement des mathématiques nécessaires pour l'étude de la dynamique économique, un sujet que j'ai concentré une grande partie de ma carrière de recherche. Cette première visite a été l'origine d'une longue collaboration intellectuelle et d'importantes amitiés qui se poursuivent encore de nos jours. Comme euh, Pierre-Louis a mentionné, le premier jour de, ma, de cette visite à Paris, j'ai travaillé avec Pierre-Louis et Jean-Michel Lasserie sur une nouvelle modélisation du marché du pétrole qui utilise le, le, le MFG. Euh, j'ai également tiré beaucoup de profits de mon enseignement fréquent à Dauphine et des flux des étudiants et post-doctorants français à Chicago et plus tard à Princeton et à Columbia. Euh, D'autre côté, mes étudiants et mes collègues aux États-Unis ont aussi grandement bénéficié des visites des chercheurs du, du CERMA, notamment euh, Ivar et Jean-Michel et Pierre-Louis. Je veux dire que, euh, pour finir, que les recherches sur lesquelles est basée mon exposé d'aujourd'hui ont énormément profité de ma longue collaboration avec mes collègues de Dauphine. Et vous avez, vous avez, vous avez, vous, vous, avez, vous il va avoir des échos de la, de la, de la, de l'exposé de Pierre-Louis dans cette présentation aussi. Bon. Je vais parler aujourd'hui de, c'est ici, ah, très bien. Ok. 
So, je vais parler aujourd'hui de, de spéculation, surtout en art. Mais je vais commencer en parlant de la spéculation financière parce que les modèles de la spéculation d'art sont, 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 sont plus ou moins copiés des choses que j'ai faites sur, sur, le, sur, le, sur les actifs financiers. L'application est qui est différente. Bon. Et je commence à parler de l'histoire des boules. Hein. Et je vais changer pour l'anglais parce que c'est plus facile pour lire le, lire le, lire le slides. So bubbles uh, are, you know, there are many episodes that people call bubbles in, in financial markets. There's not much agreement about the economic mechanisms that generate such uh, episodes. Now, most of the time when people are talking about bubbles, I mean, the most interesting phenomenon on bubbles perhaps are prices. Prices are high perhaps higher than they should be. And that's what people call a bubble. That's how people think about a bubble. But the problem is that prices, uh, to say that prices are high is always complicated because to tell you that a price is high, I have to think of a model that tells me what the right price is. And, mo and there's a lot of disagreement about the model of the right price. That's what, in fact, sustains a bubble. If we all agree this is worth 10, then it's worth 10. Somebody must think it's worth more than 10. So uh, what some of this research have been involved with is trying to determine other empirical regularities that ha help explain the mechanisms that generate bubbles. So I'll start with some observation. By the way, this is some work with several colleagues, Patrick Bolton, Harrison Hong, uh, Wei Xiong in particular. And these, these I, I'll start by citing uh, three stylized facts concerning bubbles. Then I'm going to discuss the particular model for bubbles and argue that they fit its fact. And then I'll go talk about bubbles in art and make a short conclusion. So here are the stylized facts. Although I'm going to cite three, I really am going to concentrate in two of them because of the, of the interest in bubbles in art. Uh, the first is that asset price bubbles coincide with the increase in trading volume. People trade a lot during bubbles. The second is that asset bubbles implode, implode because people figure out how to supply the asset that people are trying to pay so much money for. Bubbles don't end because people become rational and decide, oh, that's too high a price. Bubbles end because people produce a lot of stuff and eventually all the crazies have bought what they want, and they're not, not new crazies to, to buy the stuff. So that's, that's the way. Now, there's also the fact that asset bubbles often coincide with financial technological innovation. By the way, I think that plays a role in bubbles in art, but I'm not going to talk about this today. So let me start with some examples of bubble and trading volumes. So the first bubble for which we have data is the South Sea bubble. Okay, which is something that happened in the UK. All, it all happened in one year. By the way, bubbles tend to be quite short. In two or three years, they usually go away. This one lasted less than a year, lasted from January until September of the year 1720. Now, this was a, a, a rise and fall of the price of the South Sea Company shares and other similar joint stock companies in 1720. And the reason we have data is that some of these companies survive until today. Also, the British were the first to have good business historians. But the Bank of England, the same one that still exists today, was then a private company, was in charge of issuing small bills so people could use in transactions, which is like a, like a central bank. And so there used to be the number of shares, we know that between 1717 and 1719, there were typically 2,000 transactions a year. In 1720, which is the year of the bubble, there was almost 7,000 transactions. Now, about 100% of the total stock of shares of the Bank of England changed hands in that year. To give you an idea, this is now what we trade. The typical New York Stock Exchange share trades about 100% a year. So, but you have to understand the difficulty that it involved on trading at that time relative to, to today. Uh, you had to, you, there was a book kept somewhere. People, you have to go sell, you went somewhere to sell the shares to somebody else and that share had to be written on the book. 
The book was usually closed during the summer. You know, people have to take a vacation, whatever. So there are no transactions during the summer. So to trade 100% a year, it's kind of phenomenal. It's a phenomenal number. There are other companies. There were uh, something called the East India Company, which still has very beautiful porcelain that you can find in antiquaries. Uh, but they were actually exploiting, they were actually dealing with, uh, you know, they were in charge of the, what was then called the East Indians, which is what we call India today. Um, and um, the Royal African Company, they turned more than 150% of, of stock outstanding. This is all in a paper by some historians that motivated, you know, this research. Now, I don't know how good this figure is. So if you go to the Tate in London, there's a painting by Ward, which is called A Scene in Change Alley in 1720. Now, this was painted much after, so I'm not sure that Ward ever observed that scene. But in any case, it gives an idea what people thought. You see the crowd and everybody, and everybody um, um, screaming uh, to buy the stock. Now, more important, and I want to go back to this, uh, at the time, okay, I'll, I'll get back to that in a moment. So there's a lot of other facts about, about trading volume. All the bubbles that I've looked at, you see this is no increase in trading volume. So you can look at what predated the great fall of the stock market in the 1930s. That's true. Um, you have that during the dot-com bubble, um, et cetera. So that's the first, first motivating fact. The second motivating fact is that bubbles implode as a result of increase in asset supply. So the South Sea bubble is again very interesting for that in 1720. Uh, you had this very high price, not only for the South Sea company, but also for other companies of the same style. Now, of course, people figure out, why shouldn't I make money by creating a company if I can sell stocks so high at such a high price? Now, if you look at business history of, of the UK, um, you find very exotic companies that were created at that time, some of which make no sense. Now, whether this, all these stories are true or they are, you know, exaggerations, I, my favorite one is that somebody was creating a company to produce cannons, they're gonna shoot square, ball, square balls. Okay. Now, if you know any, any physics, you know that's not a way of shooting a cannon. But that was uh, one of the business plans, and this person got to sell stock. In fact, the name bubbles come from that period. It actually signifies not what we think or we think of a bubble, it's like a soap bubble. It signifies something which had nothing inside. And those are these companies. The people, after, of course, it blew up, they, they, they found that. So that's, that's the origin of bubbles. During the dot-com period, there was an enormous increase in, you know, the, during the, the dot-com period, the typical company that went public, when company went, went public in the following way, they sold a, f a small number of shares, and most of the shares were owned either by venture capitalists that had financed the firm, or the people had working at the firm, right? These people had the so-called um, lock-up period. So when the first stocks were sold to the public, they, they could not sell their own stock. And typically, they were only allowed to sell stock six months later. So they had to wait for six months to sell the stock. Now, um, if you see what happens in 1999, on the third quarter, the venture capital firms, which had financed all these firms, had distributed less than $4 billion to the limited partners, meaning their investors. In the, third, in the first quarter of 2000, of 2000, they distributed 21 billion. So you can see the way the distribution occurred was basically that either these venture capital firms had to sell the stock that they received, or they had to give the stock to the investors who then proceeded to sell. So you can see this enormous increase. Now, another place to, of, of, of supply, and this enormous increase of supply is, uh, came just before the dot-com bubble imploded in the early 2000s. Now, another very amusing thing is uh, actually a book, and, which is also a movie, called The Big Short. 
So the movie Big Short, or the book Big Short, is about how people figure out how to short this, create more of the um, securities of so-called CDO securities, the mortgage-backed securities, and how that caused the implosion of the credit bubble. Okay, so how do you think about a model in which you have bubbles like this? Uh, I'm not gonna do any math here. The math involves a lot of the stuff that PLV was talking about, continuous time. Um, I just gave a talk at, uh, at for the economist here a couple of days ago on, that, on, on some, of that, uh, some of those models that I've been developing uh, with co-authors. Um, and they have basically two ingredients. Okay, the first ingredient is it has to be costly to short. And that's the story of the big short, in fact. Because if you can short securities, the supply, the pessimists can create an infinite supply. So that's the first ingredient. The second ingredient is that difference in beliefs exists, as Francoise talked about, and they're volatile. So the optimists today, when they're buying a stock, they're thinking, okay, today I'm an optimist that I'm willing to pay this high price. Why am I willing to pay this high price? Is it because I think I'm going to go home, or maybe retire in Monte Carlo, enjoying the dividends for that stock? Or is it because I want to buy the stock today because tomorrow Bruno is going to be even more optimistic than I will be, and I'll have the chance to sell it to him at this high price? Now, I think that most speculative uh, episodes occur because of the second thing. It's not because every, the optimists just are buying to hold the stock. And that's why you see a lot of volume. You can see why you see a lot of volume. And the more volatile our, our beliefs are, I get two things. First, I get a higher price because I know that Bruno is going to show up more Bruno or somebody like him is going to show up quicker. So I have a higher, more of an opportunity to sell. That's number one. Okay. But I'm also going to get more trading because everybody, a crazy guy, every time a crazy guy shows up even more optimistic, we're going to trade. So that's the correlation that you see in the data between a lot of volume and high prices. I had some more slides of this, but I don't need to talk anymore about this. Now, let me go back here. Now, I can go here. Now, good. Now, let's assume now, all of a sudden, uh, somebody increases the supply. We're gonna talk about that in a moment. You know, maybe because they figure out there's something very, people are willing to pay a lot for this. So I create a substitute. I can't create exactly the same thing, perhaps, but I can create something close enough that will draw the interest of the Brunos of this world, which are very rational and very optimistic, okay? Now, as soon as that happens, I know that I have certain shares, but now there are twice as much shares as before. Bruno comes in and wants to buy but he has limited capital or has uh, some risk aversion and so on. So I have to sell it not only to Bruno, but to a person who is perhaps not as optimistic as Bruno, Ivar. Ivar is a little crazy, not as crazy as Bruno, so he thinks it's pretty good, but not as good as, as, Bruno, as Bruno thinks. So now, because there's a higher supply, I have to sell it not only to Bruno, but also to Ivar. And you understand, in economics, the price is determined by the marginal buyer. So what I get is determined by what Ivar pays. Now, Bruno is super happy because he bought something he thinks is worth a lot by the price that a moderate, crazy guy like Ivar is willing to pay, okay? So he's happy. But I, as a seller, I get less. Well, because I'll get less when I sell, okay, I will uh, have uh, I will have, I will pay less for it because I know that I'm going to get less at, at, when I sell. So the higher the volume, the smaller the bubble. Okay, so that's the first phenomenon. The second phenomenon is that 
because there's so many people that have to hold the stuff, there's going to be in the end less trading. Right? Because if everybody already holds the stock, even if they hold a little bit already, so Bruno always held some before he went crazy. And now he becomes super optimistic. Okay, he buys some. If R already has some of the stuff, so he's not going to buy more when, because he's not so optimistic. Okay? So you get less trading. Trading occurs because you get more trading when there are more differences of opinions and when the guys who become optimistic want to buy most of the, most of the supply. So you get less turnover. Things turn over less because they're already in the hands of a lot of different people, some of which are already pretty optimistic, but never, never become so crazy. Okay? So the increase in supply lowers turnover. turnover. So I want to... This is right. Okay. So now I'm going to start, start talking about art. And, yeah, I have another, how much time do I have? 15? 20. 20. Okay, 20 minutes. So that's plenty. So now I'm going to talk about art. So the first thing I want to postulate is that there are volatile differences of opinions in art. Okay? Uh, that's a postulate. All right? I'm not going to defend this postulate because I think it's obvious. The second is that shorting art is very difficult. It's basically impossible. You know, I may think that the Jeff Koons that sold for $80 million last week in New York, it's a crazy price. But I cannot short a Jeff Koons. I cannot sell, go to an auction and say, I'll go short a Jeff Koons. Because that's just not doable. Okay? Now, of course, there are markets in which you can short stuff, but art is not one of them. Okay? So, let me start with some work that has used some of these theories by Penasa and Rennebuch, which are actually my co-authors in the current paper in art. So what they did is that they showed, in fact, in art, there's a positive correlation between volume of trade and par prices of art. When the prices of art go, go, are very high, those are periods in which there's a lot of trading in art. And I'll tell you how this, the thing is measured in a while. Okay? And also they document if you buy art in a pure of high volume, your return is going to be lower than when you buy art in a period of low volume. And that's a, a measure of, of bubble, right? Because your return does not be lower because you pay too much for it. Okay, so those are facts that I'm not going to talk about. I'm just going to take as given. But here I'm going to examine another implication. Do decreases in the expected future supply decrease prices Okay? And turnover. Right? Remember, we're saying that increase in supply should decrease prices, right? And if the anticipated decrease in supply, price should, should go down. And if turnover also is affected by the supply, is affected also by the supply, if I know the future supply is going to decrease, that's going to decrease turnover. Okay. Now, I should emphasize decreasing price is a natural consequence of any theory in which supply affect prices. That's, but I'm going to give you a measurement of that. But the decrease in turnover is less obvious and support the theory of speculation that I just described. So that's where we are now. And I'm going to start telling you about how we're going to measure the decrease in supply. How are we going to measure the decrease in supply? Well, When you buy art from a live artist, okay, uh, what can affect the, the supply is determined by the future, by what the artist has produced until now, and now the future production of art. Right? So, what's a shock to that system? A shock to the system is a premature death, especially if it's totally unexpected. And I'll talk about that in a moment. Okay? So, when an artist dies, what happens? The supply, the expected future supply, which was supposed to increase over time, okay? when an artist dies prematurely, and that artist has, um, especially if the uh, premature death is an early age, but also unexpected, people are surprised, and all of a sudden the supply, the expected supply of that art is going down. Okay? So instead of going up, 
I'm going to go down, but that's just a question of sight. Okay. And I'm going to show you that it has a big influence, not only on prices, but also has an influence on the amount that people trade on that artist. Which, as I said, really kind of uh, is predicted by the theories of speculation. Okay, so in fact, that's a very old idea. The effect in price is a very old idea. And there's a play by uh, Charles Guillaume Etienne, which was very popular in the 19th century in Paris, is uh, Vaudeville. It was called Rembrandt ou la vente après décès. And the way this play works, there's a plot of this play is the following. Um, Rembrandt is in financial trouble, so he leaves Amsterdam, where he lived, and Saskia, his wife, dresses in black. She doesn't say anything, but she's just dressed in black. And then in the play, the demand for Rembrandt's work surges, and the widow sells many, of course, and then Rembrandt reappears. That's the play, that's the play, the Vaudeville play. Apparently, this is a, you know, I cannot read Dutch, but one of my co-authors is Flemish, so he can read Dutch. He says that this, this historian, De Wilt, says that in fact, there's a certain truth to that story. Apparently, some Italian art dealer, uh, kind of convinced Saskia to play the same, and Rembrandt to play, this, to play this game. So, but anyway, there's a play, it was very popular. Now, there's another story which is very interesting. You know Basquiat, who Basquiat is. Basquiat is, again, one of those guys who died very early and whose prices are crazy, you know. Again, he's another artist who's, who's, who a painting went for $80 million or $100 million, some crazy price like this. Now, in 1985, Andy Warhol was kind of Basquiat's discoverer to a certain extent. In 1985, he's, he, he wrote, this is from his diaries, I think. Someone was saying that when all these dealers heard there was a really talented black artist who would probably die off soon from drugs, that they heard to buy the things and now, I guess, they are frustrated because he's staying alive. Of course, they did, he didn't stay alive for that long, for another three years. But he's talking about in 85, so you say those people are frustrated because he, he stayed alive. So this notion is a notion which is uh, very well known. Now, the notion that buyers of art are speculators are also no, is also an old one. So this is Forbeck. Forbeck is the art dealer in the play that I was describing to you, and he says, Pour moi, les tableaux des grands prix sont ceux que plus cher on m'achète. Après tout, que m'importe les talents. So he was a speculator for Beck, who was buying the art from Rembrandt in the play. Okay, now, nowadays it's even worse, because nowadays there are people who buy art, people can buy art, or many people buy art, especially expensive pieces, and they simply store it on the hope of selling for, for, for a higher price. And in fact, as always, the people that decide that are making a profit out of that by creating uh, infrastructure for that to occur. So this is from a story in the New York Times, um, Art for Money's Sake. This is, of course, a famous, it's a play on a famous Warhol, Warhol uh, uh, piece. So, um, so they're talking about the facilities to store art and facilitate resale. So there's one called Wovo, which has 200, 280,000 square feet. You divide by 10, you get square meters, okay? Uh, in Long Island City. Long Island City is between Queens, is in Queens officially, between, but it's next to Brooklyn, but it's very close to the airports, especially to LaGuardia. So the facility seems designed to turn physical objects into liquid assets. What they have, they have private viewing rooms for deal making, and so art becomes more like a tradable unit, able to change hands without e even leaving the warehouse. So if you buy an expensive piece on, a, on an auction and now you want to turn it over, okay, the, your piece is there, you find a buyer, the buyer shows up there, it's shown to the buyer, the buyer, if you guys agree on the price, now it becomes a piece, the piece now belongs to the buyer, it doesn't have to leave the, the facility, it just changes property, just like gold, at the Federal Reserve Bank in New York. Different countries maintain go there. Now, of course, the Europeans don't want to be behind. So in Luxembourg, there's called something called Le Freeport uh, at Fandel Airport, which intends to attract potential investors 
present the globalized art world, notably financial professionals. This I got from a report by Deloitte, who is a consulting firm all over the world, but in particular in Europe. So they didn't stay behind. So how do you think of that? So here's how we're going to measure prices and turnover. We're going to look at auction data. Okay? Auction data, uh, two sources, two large sources. The, the, and we take the data from 57 to 2016. The price is a hammer price in 2015 dollars. Doesn't account for, for commissions and so on. And we're gonna look at the, you know, we're interested in death of an artist. So we look at the artists that we are alive in 1957. And there are close to 2,400 artists in this data set that were alive in 1957 that sold art that was, that was uh, 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 collected by this data set. Now we're gonna focus on the 258 artists who passed away before turning 66 no later than 2015. That's to give us a, a year of data post-death. So those are we're gonna call the treated artists. Okay? Now, in 70, for 70, 64% of these artists, we know the cause of death. Uh, and we know which ones suffer sudden death. That means murder, there's a case of murder, by the way. Uh, heart attack, suicide, overdose, etc. Okay. For those, 44% of those 64% had the sudden death. Others had death that we couldn't really classify or as, as sudden. Okay. So here it is. We want a counterfactual. And the counterfactual we are trying to figure out is this. Eva Hess was a great, she was one of the founders of post-minimalism, was a very important artist. And she died at 34, very young. Her death it was somewhat sudden, hard to classify. She died of brain cancer, but she found out she had brain cancer just about a few months before she died. So it's hard to say whether it was sudden or not, but at least she died young for sure, 34. And then we have to think, what would have been the prices and volumes of Eva Hess if she had not died? Of course, we don't have the counterfactual. So we had to find a statistical way of matching the counterfactual. This is what we did. We found an artist they did not die before 1966, before the age of 66, nor he died before 1980, which is 10 years after Eva Hess died. Eva Hess died in 70, so we found an artist who died, either was alive all the time of the sample, or who died after 66, and did, die, did not die very close to Eva Hess. So he lived long enough after Eva Hess. Now, he required that artist was born within a 10-year interval of the year that Eva Hess was born. So between 1926 and 1946, trying to find a similar artist. Okay. Then we wanted to also have sold a similar amount of pieces and comparable prices at auctions in the years before Eva Hess died. So before she died, you find an artist who had the same kind of market that she had. And finally, we want the artists to have the same fame in the year of death of Eva Hess, was just as famous. Now we measure fame in a particular way. We look at the citation in the, go the books in English that were digitized by Google Books in the year of her, before her death. So you see how many citations Eva Hess had, how many citations this artist had. And we found Frank Stella. Frank Stella, of course, is a super famous artist. He's still alive. He was born in 1936, the same year as Eva Hess. Um, was just as famous as her, and he's still doing stuff. You can go, you know, I saw uh, uh, Eva Hess, uh, uh, Eva Hess, uh, Frank Stella, big show just about a few years ago, mostly with part of things that he had done recently. So he's still a very active artist. Okay, now there are other examples, okay? In fact, we use a matching algorithm to match all the 258 artists at the same time. You don't do that one by one because you want to, Make sure that you get the best match for everybody. So if you know Serge Polyakov, French artist, was, ma was matched with Balthus. Marcel Brothers, Br Brothers who, is a, who is a Belgian artist, was married to Knox Martin. Yves Klein, another great French artist, was married to John Olsen, who is an Australian artist still alive. Some of those are alive, some died, but died after the age and 10 years later, as I said. It's not important that artists defer what's the media, what's the size, because um, 
the regression I'm going to control for that. We succeeded in matching all but three of our artists. Basquiat was one we couldn't match. There just simply isn't anybody that at 23 was as famous as Basquiat uh, in, the, in our data, in history. So we didn't make it. Um, the artists that match the Twitter has formed a control group. Now we have two groups. The Twitter group, that is the ones that died young, and then the, the, the control group. Now, um, okay. so what we do is run a regression. I'm not going to tell you what a regression is. But it's a regression where we control for a lot of things, you know, what kind of, um, some fixed effects about the artist, but also about what the particular piece of art at auction was. So whether how big it was, whether it was a photograph, whether it was a sculpture, whether it was a, a, a painting, or gouache, et cetera, et cetera, okay? So we try to call that. And we also control the artist's characteristics such as age and notoriety, at that particular year. Okay. Now, and now we are trying to figure out the coefficient of beta one, which is what happened to the price if that artist dies. We do the same thing with volume. Okay, it's a slightly different uh, uh, specification, but it's not important at this point. And here's what we found. Okay, if you die prematurely, your price is increased by fifty percent. That's a big number. Okay. On the other hand, your volume of trade, how many auction, things go to auction, increases by 72%, which is even bigger, I mean, in percentage terms. Okay, so enormous increase in volume. Everything is highly statistically significant. The tables tell you that. I don't have time to go to the tables. Now, the effect on prices, what this graph shows is that that shows your year relative to death. So we took all the artists together and said, this is what happened the year they die, this is one year until nine, and then after 10. And this is what happened below. And what you find is that there's really a big change the year after they die, and it's more or less because standard errors, you know, the, bear, the bars are standard error, the, the, the dots are, are point estimates. If you look at the point estimates, they're basically the same, okay? Which says prices go up and go up forever. Once somebody dies, they're going to have higher prices. Same thing for volume. So it's not that all of a sudden prices go up, and people think, oh, that's worth too much money, let me sell it now. 10 years after, you still have the same increase in volume. People really speculate and trade on those things. So that's what, uh, it's remarkable. And it's basically the same. Um, also, premature death only matter if the artist is famous. Okay, now, some people get rediscovered, but most people are not rediscovered. So if you're not famous by the time of death, okay, your prices are not going to do much. Uh, there is exception, of course. I've talked about statistical fact. The third is that if you look at people who had premature but also sudden death that we know had sudden death, they were murdered, they committed suicide, or et cetera, then the price is increased by 72% instead of 50%. And volume increased by 120% instead of 70%. So then the effect, so that makes a lot of sense. So it's not only if you die, those things happen. If you die, nobody expected, the change is very big. Now, the death effect declines with age. That's what I would, you'd expect. It's very big if you die below 50, and then keeps declining. It continues to exist, of course, at 65. It's still quite positive. But by the time you get to 85, if you die at 85, you're not going to have any price effect. You don't have any volume effect either. This is just, uh, the pictures are all the same. Now, so I've got just in time to finish. The art auction is a market, is a market which is a good testing ground for theories of speculation. I was surprised how well it worked. I got into this project simply because I was interested in art. And I thought I was not going to find much, but that's okay. I'm going to learn more about art. And it's a, it's a very good testing ground for that. The volume effect of premature death supports theories of speculation based on shorting costs and volatile difference beliefs. Now, another fact I want to bring for, to you is this. The other people have shown how much money you make if you buy art. 
And economists always think, finance people always think about what we call risk-adjusted returns. So we look at the excess return over the treasury bill, right? And then we divide essentially by the volatility of returns. And what happens is that art has about a quarter to a half the risk-adjusted return of the US stock market. So it's not a good purchase. Unless you're gonna enjoy it. all those people who are putting this stuff in, in warehouses and buying for speculation, I'm very doubtful they do well. Uh, by the way, that's, that's, this work by, this, by Kotovic in his co-author does not even account for the transaction costs. It's just the price difference. So an art has substantial transaction costs. Auction, an auction house would charge a, good, a big percentage, sometimes as much as 10% of the selling price, or that depends on how big the, uh, the price is. We also did an analysis of repeat sales and show a large different returns in purchase sale pairs that bracketed an expected death. So if you buy before an artist dies and expect and sell after, then you actually make money. So that says the rest will make even less money because the other, uh, the other work did not distinguish between, between those. So making money in art investment is very difficult, with the possible exception of purchases that precede unexpected death of the author. So any Warhol is right. If you really want to speculate in art, what you have to do is buy something that somebody you know is going to die, but other people don't. That's the part of it, and you will all forget it, because by the time all those dealers knew, the price probably went pretty high. But it's still buying Basquiat turned out to be a great, if you bought it before he died, and held it until today, that was an amazing investment. Thank you. Thank you very much. One question? Uh, delightful, thank you. Uh, did, uh, you mentioned that one of the artists uh, uh, in, uh, that, that, you, that, you, that you studied uh, uh, was murdered. Uh, do we know? I, I forgot who it is. That I forgot who it is. I'm sorry, I forgot who it is. It was on the database. I remember looking at it at some point. I knew, but I forgot who the person was. Uh, I'm sorry, but that would be a good reason. That would be a good reason, especially if you was a young artist. You know, there's one case. Yeah, okay. So I do. I do remember who who was murdered. There was one person who we suspect was murdered. Her name was Anna Bandieta. She was married to also to a. F uh, to a famous uh, artist named Carl Andre. So Carl Andre was taken to trial. He claimed she committed suicide. And what happened is that she was thrown or jumped from the window of her loft in Soho. They had a fight before she died. And he went to trial, but he was found not, not guilty. So that's the case of murder I know. But, so you could argue that didn't know, but he owned her art. Right, right. In this case, he owned her art. He was more famous than she was at the time. Um, and in the trial, he explained that that was the reason for the fight. She was upset that he was getting all the fame, whatever. That's how, what he said. But he got away with it. If he murdered, he got away with it. But that's the one case of murder in the data, in the data set. Any other question? So, um, did you investigate whether the effect of a premature death depends on the kind of death? Like there might be deaths that are more romantic or you know, more like in the legend of a, uh, some artist. Uh, so maybe if he commits suicide, it has a higher effect than if he has a, st a strike or something. Yeah, okay, so, so we did not do this exactly, um, but the, we looked at something else which is close to that, which is whether or not there is a lot of increase in fame just after the death, which is connected to that, which doesn't seem to have much of an effect. You know, the people who were, for which the prices go up, are already pretty famous. So that not, doesn't seem to have a big increase in, I would suspect that what you're talking about would raise the, the the fame, in a sense. But it, it doesn't seem to be important. But it could be interesting to look at more detail. Uh, there are not that many suicides. There are few, 
but not that many. Um, because it also, again, these things are very hard. How do we find out all those causes of death? This was two years of my undergraduate students at Columbia going through Google pages, Wikipedia pages, Google uh, obituaries in newspapers, in the major newspapers, et cetera. And after two years, we only had 64% of our people because a lot of people you can't find. They say died, but you know there was an obituary or something, but they don't say the cause. You can't find the cause. The Wikipedia case, there was no cause. Of course, Fernanda Magneta was easier because there was a public trial. Eva Hess was very, very famous. She died of this brain cancer. It says that she died of brain cancer, but also says she, she learned about her brain cancer a few weeks before, uh, a few months before her death. So it's very hard to classify. So I think this is difficult to do this classification of death, but it's an interesting, an interesting point. What you do? No, we didn't, we did not, you know, it's a problem with the data set, you know, we have about 300 artists only, so you can only, 258, so you can only divide in so many ways. But in the work that my co-authors did earlier on prices, okay, and bubbles, which is more direct, just looking at prices and volume, okay, that effect is predominantly, through this period, in contemporary art, very contemporary art, which means you're not looking at death or anything like that. So there's some, some type of arts who seem to be more bubbly than others. So there was, I think, there was a big bubble that blew up in the late 80s, I think, in art. And that did not involve impressionists or people like that, you know. They, they were not looking at death. Of course, all the impressionists are dead by the time we start with our data set. So there are no impressionists among our, our dead uh, people. But, it's, it's hard, you know, I think we are, it's really hard to do more. There's a lot of interesting ideas, this is one of them, but it's really hard when you have 258 data points to make, to start dividing your data set and, and getting a lot of information. So that's, that's our limit. It would be good if we had more, but there's not that many more people who die. We need an artist who died, we need an artist which was, you know, we know that you're not gonna get an effect and that was already pretty famous and so on. And we only have data since 1957 because there's no, no good price data before that. Starting in 57, there are these two sources of um, data. The first one has most of the big auction houses, you know, Chris's and Sotheby's and so on. There's a bunch of them, Phillips and so on. But the second one has the smaller places, which is very good. And they st started increasing their coverage. So now even small auctions that go somewhere in some small uh, Latin American capital, they would still they would have the data. Now they're really collecting a lot of data on art, but it's only in the later, latest period. Now I have three more years, so there may be more stuff to do. Une toute petite dernière question, si on a une. Non. Dans ce cas, je vous propose de remercier José encore.